Hi everybody, uh, welcome to the latest episode of From the Rock to the Cloud uh, with me, Tom Hall. Uh, as you know, I'm the host of this series. Um, we're deeply into season two now, um, and this being the second episode. And as always, we try and discuss things server, Azure, rock, cloud, related. It's in the title. It's obvious when you think about it. Um, and that's what we try and cover. And we try and make it as fun as interesting as possible. Uh, each episode, uh, we have a special guest. Um, we had this guy on the first episode of this season two. We've actually got him on the second episode of season two. Um, he's going for like a kind of a record. Um, will he make it through to episode three of season two? I, I don't know. We might kill him off. It might be a red a wedding situation where we just, you know, we just, we just get off Tom, Thomas Moira. No, only joking. Um, but you know, as always, we try and talk about things that are hopefully of interest to you. Uh, please let us know if you have any comments. Uh, let me know if you want to talk about anything in particular. If you have any comments, um, send them over to us, and we will try and address those for you so that you can you can get that insight from um, said expert. Um, so today's session, today's chat. Um, by the way, before I, I've just got to say that is a cool T-shirt. I, I love I love the Able T-shirt. I think that is brilliant. By the way, Thomas. So we 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 we're going to talk about. Um, well, we're not going to accept uh, the defaults uh, as your T-shirt says. We're going to talk about modernizing applications, uh, Windows containers, and Kubernetes. Um, hopefully, you'll explain to me what Kubernetes is later on. So, but. Please, um, and so for the next thirty minutes, we're going to talk uh, talk with uh, the one, the only Thomas Moira. So Thomas Moira, uh, as always, if you could just uh, you know tell us a little bit about yourself, as always, because even though we only spoke to you last episode, but who are you? <laughs> Absolutely. So first of all, again, thank you for having me again. Um, it's always great uh, <laughs> to talk to you. Um, yeah, my name is Thomas Maurer. I'm part of the Azure Cloud Advocates. Uh, we are part of the Azure engineering team. And what we are actually uh, working on is like creating content, delivering content, such as presentations, talking to customers and communities, uh, but also listening to feedback. So we want to know from customers what is working, what is not working, where do we need to improve so we can actually go out and fix that by ourselves or work with our peers uh, in the program management and engineers to make our products better. So um, yeah, and today I'm here to talk, as you said, about uh, modernizing your applications with Windows containers. Right, well, let, let, let's get to it. And don't forget the Kubernetes. Right, here we go. Uh, okay, so uh, Thomas, just um, today's a container, right? A con like a container. The only, like, you know, you get containers on ships. Um, we get containers that can, you know, you can put liquid in. Um, but what? why Windows containers? What's that all about? Yeah. What is a Windows container? <laughs> So containers is not necessarily like just something uh, Microsoft came up with, right? It's not something um, we would have actually uh, like invented or something. It, containers exist in the industry for quite a while now. And what you can think is that what, what you realize is like, if you think back in the time where we actually went from physical servers to virtual servers um, to basically get the benefit of leveraging more of the CPU and virtualization stuff so that like, idle servers do not need physical hardware. We get the mobility, uh, all the benefits of we, we got by doing server virtualization. Now, this is this is great, but still, like if you think about it, every server still has a, um, a operating system and has obviously some overhead. So in every virtual server, you run an operating system, which has some base services. Um, and that like, if you run hundreds of them, you run that hundred times. Um, also yeah. that's like, even though virtual machines are a couple of gigabytes in size and we have pretty good connectivity and networks these days, but that's not always the case. Um, it would be great if that they would be way lighter, right. Uh, to like have them even more mobile, take them less resources and so on. And that is stuff which we will see containers can provide. And, um, okay. I think. I think that is that there are a couple of reasons why we would actually benefit of that. There is much, much more. There's a ton of stuff, um, but think about it as the evolution of uh, virtualization in terms of hey, I did like what we did with uh, virtualization, like server virtualization. In the first place is we actually created virtual hardware, right? So it was like a, a, we simulated or emulated yeah. or um, virtual hardware, like virtual CPUs and virtual disks. Now. 
when we do co uh, containers, we're actually thinking about um, simulating the operating system. Like instead of like doing okay. all the hardware stuff, just use the same operating systems for okay. multiple different isolated applications. So it's, it's kind of like the gig economy, right? It's it's getting that it's it's streamlining, getting that bit of the virtual machine to just repeat and be more efficient, and to basically just do more of the same job at scale. So it creates yep. these kind of like bucket buckets of, of of available performance in the areas you need to be optimized. And that's, yep. that's how I, that's how I understood it from what you just yep. said. Yep. Yeah, think about like all the things you think about virtual machines, which are like, or, or a lot of the things which are challenging with virtual machines, right? I mean, they have benefits, but there are some challenges. They're still, like, as I mentioned, big. They have some like uptime you need to take, like the, until their boot, their boot time, for example. You cannot just go out and just shut it down and start it. I mean, it, it's fast, but like, it's not like, hey, I just do it like that, right? And mm -hmm. so there's a ton of different things out there uh, which help us. Uh, uh, in terms of dealing with that, but then also making it more mobile. So one of the okay. things which is really important is the problem we had with, um, oh, it worked on my machine, but it didn't doesn't work in production anymore, right? So yeah. I go out, I install, I install, install the application, for example, here on my machine. I give you the same stuff, the same setup. You install it again because you need to do production, uh, but it suddenly doesn't work anymore. So how can we prevent that from happening? And with yeah. doing, with using containers, actually, instead of like creating a new virtual machine and setting things up, everything again, I create a container image and we will talk all about that, what, what that is and what that looked like. And then okay. you, I just give you that container image and you can run it and it will run the application in the exact same way um, as, as I did it with, on, on my computer. And so that, that is, or on my server. Uh, for that matter, uh, so that is uh, that is one of the problems. Containers are very good in solving it. Cool. Okay, so we sort of, I think we understand what a container is now, so that's great. But how how do I run a Windows container then? Can you show me? Yeah, absolutely. So before I go into that, let me give you some background uh, on on that slide here um, to show okay. you how that can actually look like. So the things we just yeah, talked yeah. about, I think it's very important. Uh, so when we looked at this uh, in the past, uh, this is like, we had like physical hardware, we installed the operating system on top of it, and then we installed our applications and services on that like operating system. Now, yeah, that we, then did, we did then that in a virtual environment where we created virtual hardware. Um, and then um, we basically did the same thing again, right? So we have a user space with the application and we have a kernel space uh, where we have these applications. Now, what we are doing it, with is containerized- the kernel space called, it, Sorry, Thomas, is the kernel space called a bucket? <laughs> I, no? I, I would say, no, no. <laughs> I, I mean, but, sorry, I, I like we probably need to cut this out. Like, what, what... You didn't get my joke, like because obviously the kernel, the kernel has a bucket. It's KFC. It's, oh. it's a reference to KFC. We we'll carry on. Don't worry. Oh, about okay. That. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, that <laughs> kernel. Okay, now I got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. It was a terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. It's a terrible joke. I, I, it's a good one, but I was like thinking because like we have buckets in other technology. I was like, this is that really technology? Or is it... <laughs> But yeah, I did not Man, think of that. Them, to get them from KFC. Makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> yep. Bucket of fried chicken. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> let me quickly go back there. I mean, sorry. <laughs> no worries. You can you can get it. You can bring it again. Now I know what it what it yeah. is. So. so we have here then a user space, and then we also have a kernel space, right? Man, so I, 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 I love the kernel. Um, you know what I mean? I love the kernel. All right, carry on. Okay. So what we're doing now is instead of, of like building new virtual hardware or even physical hardware, why not just use the same operating system and kernel for multiple applications, right? Um, and that is something we did before is like we installed maybe multiple applications on the same server, but a lot of people told you that's probably not a good idea because they are dependencies and suddenly you like, um, you cannot run the same application like twice or stuff like that. So that is where the container technology actually isolates these application and services in a 
container, which makes sense, right? So then I can run like multiple applications on the same operating systems, but isolated from each other. So to show you how that can work, I'll just go to this one. So now let me show you how that how that can look like, how I can actually run a container, right? So here I'm on a on container host. This is like a Windows server where I installed uh, the container feature and I have Docker to basically manage that. So you can see here, I already have a couple of Docker or con images like container images. These are the ones from Microsoft, um, which, which I uh, downloaded already. So we can actually go out and use it. You can see here they have tags depending on the versions. And you can also see that there are different sizes. So for example, we have different images like the server core, and then we have the nano server container. Uh, which is a super small container image, especially for .NET Core applications. So these are options we can now do. And to run the container, I can just type Docker run, and then I can do IT for interactive terminal. So then basically what I can do, I can then directly, I, I directly can boot into the container. So now I take the uh, container image I want to start and I hit enter and you will see, I just started a container. You can see here, like you cannot really see, but I will show you a couple of things. If I do now host name, you can see here, this is a unique host name for the container itself, auto-generated. And then you can also see it has a file system. So I have like, because it's a Windows container, obviously it has Windows, it has users, program files and all that um, in that container. I can even run, because it's a, a server core container, I can run PowerShell. So I can do things like, for example, get process to like see, uh, what processes are running. And you can see it, the process list is pretty small for a server, right? Because it's not a full server. So let me open up here another window. This is actually the container host itself, like the one we were before where we started the container. You can see here container host one. If I do now get process here, you can see here these are the ton of processes running on the server itself, uh, including the ones from the container. And I'm going to show you that in just a bit. So for example, if we have a look at this process ID here from PowerShell, mm -hmm. uh, so six, seven, six, eight, if I do now, I do here a, let's have a look here, do a get process here that is inside the container. So obviously I will be able to see that process, right? So I can see here, okay, I can, uh, this is my PowerShell running inside the container. And now if I run that on the, con on the container host, the great thing here is if I do the same thing, get process and get the idea and can get the same ID uh, of that process on the container host, I'm actually seeing that process as well. Right? So I see from the containers I can see inside the containers. So that is great, mm. but let's have a look at like what the container can actually see. So let's have a look at, the, at another PowerShell process. Let's look at the PowerShell running, for example, here on the host itself. So if I look at that process, uh, 2408. So if I go into the container now, so I'm doing that the other way around, around. So if I get process and try to find that process, you can see, I cannot find that. So the container oh, okay. host can actually see the processes inside the container, but the container cannot see the processes from other containers or from the host itself. Right? So that is, that is pretty cool. Uh, now, yeah, that's, and, and that's, and that's how it creates that efficiency then, I guess. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I can then cool. also see, Hey, okay. There's the Docker container running. So this is the way like mm -hmm. if we do Docker PS it's running. And if I now close here, because this was an interactive container, if I then do that again, the container will shut down automatically. So like you can see here now, no container is running anymore. Uh, I just killed the container by exiting it. But depending on what I, if, if I don't know if it's a server application inside the container, then I would mm. not run it interactively and, and stuff like that I would like run it detached. And then it could actually just run in the background. It would not shut down when I, when I do things like this, but you can see how wow, fast that, it was, right? I, I mean, wow, that is it's ridiculously fast. So, so, so how is it, why is it so fast? Yep. So let me quickly like illustrate that here, uh, why this is like so fast, right? Um, we talked about it. It's obviously way smaller, um, but it also needs to do different things. So if we normally boot up a server, like a full OS server, we obviously do a power on, then we run the BIOS or uh, UAV uh, post and all that. 
and then uh, we start loading the kernel and starting this, the session and do the log on and then um, launch the Windows Explorer and then all the, the, the services which I need. Now, if you look at um, where a container starts to boot, because it leverages the kernel and everything from the operating system, which is already running on, you can see here that this is the only pro, the only the last two things are basically um, used by the container, right? So that I think is pretty cool. That is that is one of the reasons uh, why it's so fast. And if you look at the next one, it also has some cool features in there in terms of memory. Now, if you run a virtual machine, you basically assign like a fixed size of uh, memory to a virtual machine. I know we have great features like dynamic memory for virtual machines, but still there's always a fixed amount um, of memory assigned to a VM. Um, yeah. And if you look at the, ho uh, at the host here, so I have here a host, uh, it, it needs like 2.8 uh, gigabytes of memory at the moment. Um, if I start a container, it then needs like, let's say it's 200 Mac uh, for that container, because again, all the operating system stuff is already like loaded, right? I don't need to load that twice. Uh, and then if I do like five containers, you can see here, it's even then like 3.4 uh, gigabyte. The reason why it's not 200 per container, for example, in the, in this case, yeah. it's because even like processes within the containers can share the same memory. So if I start up PowerShell like three, four times, um, that process can be shared. The memory of that, of these processes, um, can be shared in theory, right? Not all the processes yeah. do that. Some of them are staying isolated, but yeah. think about that, like some like DLLs, which are loaded and stuff like that. Why would I load, if I load them in the memory, I can have multiple containers consuming that. So this is also very, very good, very, very low overhead if you actually run that. Wow, it's super efficient. So that's why it's fast. <clears throat> Great. So Windows Server 2022 containers. What what have we done? What what how how have we made that any better? You know what I mean? What's new with Windows Server 2022 with containers? That's yep. that's my question. So there's a ton of stuff, by the way, which went into the container um, uh, improvements we have with Windows Server 2022, right? Um, so first of all, you saw the container image sizes I showed you. These were containers for 2019, um, like, like around three gigabytes and like 250 max uh, for the nano server one and so on. Um, it always depending also a little bit on the patch level. But what the team did is they reduced the size by up to 40% again, like almost okay. half, right? So it's again, that again improves um, the, the speed of a um, of a uh, of a container to start, as well as like um, like you shut down and performance, and that up like usually like the, 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 they say like up uh, startup time can be like up to 30 percent better than than before or 30 percent faster than before. Okay. So those are this is one thing obviously which is a big improvement because again containers usually cannot be small enough, right? Um, you, you you want them to be as small as possible um, for the base images because um, without losing compatibility, right? So that is that is one thing we have there. Um, the other thing is which is very important is think about applications who actually do authenticate against Active Directory or uh, others. So because containers are not necessarily domain joint um, and container hosts in the cloud, like in I will mean, talk about that later on, are not necessarily domain joint. Um, we now can, for example, have group managed service accounts, which can take, uh, basically authenticate against Azure Active Directory, um, without having the container host joined to an Active Directory domain. This is super handy again, to get that portability, um, uh, we, we talked about at the beginning, uh, to enable that. And then we have a ton of improvements when it comes, for example, to networking. So, for example, like, um, and again, we're going to talk about Kubernetes in just a bit, but there's improved networking for that. Um, we have IPv6 support um, and so on, uh, which we have there. And then we have some cool new tools also to actually manage containers on Windows Server, uh, including in Windows Admin Center, for example, as well. Okay. So we've just made it a lot. It's embedded into the latest OS. Cool. Um, and in terms of, like you, you mentioned container images and layers, how does that work? Yep. Well, again, this is, I just, we just I talked just, about, just this, talked about this. 
Sorry, I had some echo here. Okay, good. Um, so we just talked about the base OS images, right? And this is an important part to understand when it comes to containers. Um, it's not like where you have a virtual machine and then you like basically uh, set up that virtual machine um, and then you go into that virtual machine and you install your application and then you, you add something, you configure something. Basically what you do is like with containers, you work kind of like as an infrastructure as code uh, type, right? So you basically write down how your container image looks like. And so if we quickly have a look at that slide, I, I quickly want to illustrate that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so when you're building a container image or you want to run a container, you basically build a container image. And so you select an OS, like a base base image um, in that sense. So we could, in, in, in the Microsoft world, we have the nano server, we have server core, um, we have also one called Windows. And again, it gets get larger and larger depending on, on what you want. Um, because if, if you're just building a .NET Core application, you don't need a lot of stuff, which is like for compatibility reasons. Um, so you would take the smallest one uh, which you take, but again, depends on what you take. Then you basically go out and you add dependencies for it, right? So you're going to be like, if, if there's anything like you need a framework or anything like .NET and stuff like that, or if you already have IS and stuff like that, you can add that as well. And then you basically add an application layer. This is then when you actually put the application on top of it. And then you put the configuration for that application on top of it. And as, you, as I said, these, or as you mentioned, these are different layers. So what happens now is what it also makes the container host so super um, efficient is that when I have run multiple containers based on the same uh, base OS image, I can share that image from a disk-based perspective, right? They can build like uh, the only thing which changes are the upper layers, but the base image is always staying the same. So I can also save a lot of, of disk space as well. So there's some pretty cool stuff here when, when it comes to layering. I think that is something great to understand. And here we need to quickly need to, like, I need to go forward. We can cut these out. Yeah. Let's just cut these here. And then, so it just goes forward on this slide. Yeah, okay. So, so how I actually would do that is like I would actually write a file, a Docker file, for example, and then I would write it in code and say, hey, for example, here, it would start with a base uh, image. In, um, like in this one, I use server core. Then I do the .NET framework. I add another layer on that. And then I add like um, the latest patches, for example, to that. Like if I want to add patches and then I could do like the application and configuration in addition. And I would write that Docker file down. And with that Docker file, I would then generate the container image, right? So that is how it works. But now the interesting part, I think, and that was what we're going to explore is like, if we, I now want to containerize a application, doing all that is pretty hard, right? It's like, a, I need to learn a lot to actually get, get, get that all done and understand and how that works and, and all that. So we want to make it easy for admins to actually containerize existing applications, right? So everyone has like web applications out there. They probably want to migrate this at one point um, and then containerizing it sounds like a good idea. So this is something uh, which I will show you in just a bit. Well, I, I, I've got two questions, Thomas, right? First of all, Kubernetes, right? So number one, what is a Kubernetes? Do you know what yeah. I mean? Because it's so, written up there. I see it, everyone talks about it everywhere. What is a Kubernetes? So the thing I just showed you like before, when I run like a one Docker container, right? Um, this is okay. Like this is like what I can do on my machine, but think about like applications, which, um, so first of all, like think about applications, which probably run multiple containers, right? So like you have one yeah. is a web app. The other one is a database. The other one is a mid tier applications. Um, you probably want to have like multiple applications work at the same time. The other thing you want to have is you probably want to scale out uh, your application as well, right? So if you're going to have like multiple web, like web servers for redundancy reasons, but also maybe for performance reasons as well. So you need an orchestrator to actually do all that, to make sure that you have enough containers, that they're all running, um, that for example, what if a container for some reason crashes, that there is a container coming up again. Um, again, taking, taking like making sure that you have enough scale and managing that. And also at the end, your container is still running in some world, 
anywhere on a physical machine. There is always something coming down to a physical machine, right? It can even run in a VM, but at the end, it's on a physical machine. Yeah. And now, to make sure what is what happens if all the containers would run on the same physical machine, um, and that physical machine crashes, your whole application would go down, right? So again, for that, we also need an orchestrator. And Kubernetes is an orchestrator um, developed like in the early stages by Google. Uh, they use that heavily for, for their internal services. Uh, but obviously also the industry went and said, hey, um, well, this is a great, great tool. This is where we, what we need and kind of like became the standard orchestrator more or less for when it comes to managing mm -hmm. containers. And we even have a service in Azure called Azure uh, Kubernetes Service, where you don't need to set up the whole orchestration. You don't need to set up your whole Kubernetes clusters. Um, we do that for you as a service, and then you can go out and deploy your containers on top of that. Uh, okay. So, so I can run containers in Azure then, and I can use the Kubernetes service as a service to help manage that. Sweet. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, um, yeah. So what you can do again, as I said, like to run containers in Azure, there are multiple ways of doing that. Kubernetes or our Azure Kubernetes service is just one of them, right? So that that is probably like if you run a lot of containers and you want to take advantage of the Kubernetes orchestrator, this is one way. Uh, we also allow you to, for example, containerize your web applications and then run them in Azure web apps, for example. Like there also there is also container support for that. We also have something for called Azure Container Instances where you just spin up. Um, a container instance without like taking care of all the Kubernetes stuff around it um, and, and all that good stuff. So we have a couple of different container services depending on um, where, where you go and what the customer's uh, needs are. Now, what I want to show you okay. though is like for us, interesting is how do I get existing applications, for example, into Azure, right? I said like, okay, okay. if I'm an admin, I, I would actually need to go out and build these container images. I would need to write these Docker files and so on. But again, we want to make yeah. it easy for, for customers to spin this up. So if you quickly have a look at this slide, what I want to show you here is um, this is, for example, what we can do. And I will show I will go show you a demo uh, directly after this. But what we're going to show you is like how you take, for example, an existing .NET application, um, and then you we build for you uh, the container image we store it in a container registry. So this is like a central place where you would put all your container images. And then from there, we can then actually go out and deploying it on Azure, on Azure Kubernetes service. And again, instead of you setting up all of that, we have a tool to actually, which can actually help you um, doing that, doing the whole containerization part and so on. Okay. So if I, if I switch, if I quickly switch to my demo here, uh, this is my uh, <laughs> super ASP.NET app. You can see I took all my web uh, design skills, um, basically, to, to get that done. Uh, but this is actually running locally on one of my web servers here, right? So this is like on a normal, virtual. it's a virtual machine, I installed IIS on it, and this is my web app. Thomas, that is not ready for the public domain, to be fair. So that's <laughs> probably the best, that's the best place for this. I, think. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I don't agree with that. I want to have that in the public domain. So what I want to do is I want to actually migrate this website again. I put so much effort into it. I want to migrate that um, to actually uh, to AKS and run it in Azure so I can actually okay. scale it out because a lot of people are wanna, wanna, definitely want to see that website. Right. So I mean, have people been asking for this. I mean, you know, that, they, I mean, they have, they have, trust me. Trust me, they have uh, they they want to have my Tom Super ASP.NET web app. That that's what they want, and um, yeah, I want to take advantage of all this stuff we have in Azure. Like, so I want to run obviously and be able to scale it uh, to have a load balancer in front of it to make sure that all the people are looking at this website or can actually get a piece of that website and it doesn't go down. Um, so let's see how we can actually go out and migrate that. And for that, I already um, prepared what we call our Azure Migrate App Containerization Tool. And this is currently, as we record this in preview, um, but it's a pretty cool tool. It's kind of like the Azure Migrate uh, tool for, for virtual machines and databases. Um, so what I did already is it's basically just let me download the script and it sets up this mini appliance here I, I have here on my screen, right? 
Um, yeah. And from here, I just go through that wizard and I want to show you quickly how easy that is. This is really, really cool stuff because even if you're not familiar with uh, building these containers and stuff like that, uh, this can be super easy. So first of all, currently in this preview, we support ASP.NET web apps and Java web apps on Tomcat. So in my case, as we saw before, this is an ASP.NET web app. And then, as I mentioned, um, in our case, we obviously want to deploy this to our Azure Kubernetes service. But um, as, as I also said before, we can also do that and deploy it on Azure App Service as well. So if I have, if in, in, in most cases, I think if I just do a web app, Azure App Service is a great place, but I plan to in the future also deploy other containers on my Azure Kubernetes service. So I'm going to select that one. Um, and then I have a couple of prerequisites. Obviously, I need to accept that this is preview software, um, the license terms. I obviously read them before, just to be sure. Um, it will check that I have internet connectivity to Azure. Um, I, that I have the latest updates and we're going to use a feature which we have for a long time. So if you are a web administrator or like if you're dealing with IIS, you're probably familiar with web deploy. So that is a, a tool we use in the background. So I can just verify if that's installed. Yes, I already prepared that. Good job. Um, and I also want to see that, okay, PowerShell remoting is actually enabled. That's good. Done that. And so the next thing I need to do is actually sign in to Azure because I want to obviously move that and do an Azure service. So what I can do here is just click on sign in, enter the code, and then quickly confirm to sign in. And now we can actually go out and select the tenant and my Azure subscription, I want to use and then continue. Next up, we obviously now need to actually go out and select the application. Now, my application I just showed you is running on a web server called Web01. And I'm just using the administrator account to get to this uh, account, uh, to that server. And then I do validation. Click on continue, that works. And now that tool, like this, this migration tool, goes out and actually discovers the application, the web apps running on IIS on that specific server. So you can see here, I deployed two apps, two, two applications. I uh, obviously, in my case, I want like, it's a currently running in default as default website. And I can then go out and do, for example, some additional application configurations. I, I will just talk about this in just a bit, but let's call this one Tom's web app. So this is the, the container name, as I showed you before, instead of having that long windows, uh, container name, it will be just my web app, which will be deployed. Um, and then again, I can do some app configurations. Now think about if you have a web app which for example, has a database in the background, right? You have a connection string. So that we would actually see that. And then we would actually take that configuration string and make sure that that actually then works with the database you're using. So if the database is running in Azure or if it's running somewhere else, um, we can configure that as well. And now um, we're going to actually build this. So I have a container registry. This is again, is the central place uh, where I'm going to store um, my container image. And this is basically the container image I'm going to create uh, from that specific app. I can then have, for example, if I look at the review at the, um, at, at the Docker file, this is now the Docker file, which I would have need to written by myself uh, if I want to do the same thing. But the tool does all of that for me. So it decided, okay, which, which version of ASP.NET do I need? And then, for example, also do copy the application um, and then also do some other stuff as well. And also say, okay, which port, for example, should be uh, exposed uh, for that container. So now let's just build that image. And this image, the great thing about this, and this will take some time, by the way, um, this will be now built in the Azure container registry, right? So usually you would you can build a container image directly on your machine. But if you're doing like this high um, 
performance task, like if you have really large uh, container images, for example, at one point, because they're very complex applications. Um, we're doing this in that case, um, we're uploading all that and do, do process that in the Azure Container Registry. So that is where now the container gets built, basically. I mean, it, it, it's actually very simple. It is, right? That is like, this is yeah. what, what the tool I mean, is all about. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you could hear that in my voice, right? You know, you could hear, I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's not actually that complicated. Um, no, no. And yeah, like, it, you know, and, and this is, it's simplifying it to the point where actually it's a few clicks. So, um, you know, that's brilliant. Uh, absolutely. No, it, and it, again, it shouldn't be like really complicated, right? It's, it's like, okay, I, I want to take that app um, and maybe I don't even, like, if I'm not a developer or if I don't even know what, like, where is the code for that app? Where is the installer for this app? I don't have that, right? It's probably installed. It's just, everyone knows it's running on that machine. The people who are installed that app, they're long gone. Um, I, but I want to containerize this and make it like running somewhere else and modernizing it using that, right? I want to like, this is what means like one server less uh, in my environment. And with that wizard, with that migration tool, I can actually take advantage of this, modernizing it and directly put it into the cloud. And again, you, you brought up a point before where you said, hey, uh, the, the, the public is not ready to see that website. Uh, AKS can also be like, deployed in Azure, but I can also just deploy it internally, right? Without having a public IP address and stuff like that. So it can still be used in a in an enterprise environment where um, you don't want to have public like access. If it's like the expense website, you probably don't want to make that available to everyone outside in, in some cases. Um, so you can can take advantage of that as well. Cool. Now, Excellent. while we are actually waiting for this, I just one thing I want to show you more is we can obviously have a look in that build process as well. So we get that information, we can see actually what's going on. And if you have a look here, you can see here, it downloads um, the, the container base image and then adds these different layers on top of it. Um, this is actually what the, the, what the um, Docker file and we just saw uh, does. And then it runs through and we get all these logs to see what's happening. So we could also see if something breaks or something like that. Uh, we could also see why is that. That's pretty cool. Excellent. Okay. So like whilst that's happening, Thomas, like let's, let's, where can I go learn about containers? Where, where's the, uh, you know, you, you know, how am I going to so learn about all of these containers? So obviously, like my number one place is definitely Microsoft Docs, right? There are like, we have documentations for Windows containers. We also have documentations uh, for how you actually then interact with Docker and all the things I showed you before to actually walk through this. But then we also have documentation for all the container services we have in Azure, including the Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, to make sure that you can see how that works. We also have now documentation for that migration tool as well. So you can go and like see all the options you have. And again, as I usually do, I make it look very simple, but um, obviously um, uh, you can, like there is obviously all the time when you're in production environments, you have a couple of more things you need to take care of. I recover that yeah. with the documentation. The other part where I recommend, if you want to learn about containers, on Microsoft Learn, which is our free learning platform, we have a lot of different uh, container tools uh, or learning modules available for you. So you can actually go through and learn about containers without having an Azure subscription, without needing of a credit card or anything. You can just go out yeah. and learn there. And even though you're just watching this and you're saying, I don't want to learn about containers, there are also a ton of other learn modules out there uh, to learn about other technologies from Microsoft. So just go out to Microsoft.com slash learn. Uh, it's absolutely a great place uh, to get started. I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. MS Learn is is an amazing resource. Um, so yeah, absolutely big advocate of that. So that's that's brilliant. Um, oh, Thomas, is it a success? Yep, it is. It is, absolutely. So what we now have done basically is built that container image and it's now stored on the um, container registry. So if I hit continue, the next thing I want to do is obviously deploy that. And so again, I could choose my Azure subscription and then I could choose my Azure Kubernetes cluster, uh, which I already run in Azure. Um, if you don't have one, as of for all the steps, you could just go out and create it directly from here. And then 
it actually goes through. Uh, if again, if I had some secrets and certificates which need to be stored, uh, I could also configure that. Since I made it very simple, I don't have that. I can also have like if if I have containers which needs a shared storage, it will also automatically configure Azure files for me because again, like containers usually are not persistent, so we need to have some shared, shared like persistent storage, for example. And then I can actually go out. I can dilute the last configuration of the deployment. So if I go hit configure, you can see here uh, what what should be the prefix of the application, which network ports I don't want app. And then here, interestingly, this one I mentioned is I could now create multiple replicas. So because this is a very important uh, application, obviously, uh, I hit there 10 replicas and I want to put them behind a external um, uh, local answer. So there will be a public IP address assigned. I could also do it if it's just an internal application. I could just select internal. We're going to apply that. And then last but not least, I could actually just go and continue. And then it will ask me again um, if I want to deploy that application. And to deploy that, I would just hit deploy and it goes out and does that all for me. And so that is how easy it is actually, not just migrating the application to the cloud, but also in the same time, going from a um, application running on a server, which could be physical or a virtual machine, to a container. Wow. Okay. Mind blown. Thank you, Thomas. Wow, Thomas, that was amazing. Like learning about containers and Kubernetes, uh, all of that good stuff. Amazing, as always. Thank you, sir. So um, we're now heading over. Um, it's that fun part. Um, the science part is done, and we're on the fun part. And so it's um, meme review time. So this is this is as always where I look a little bit silly. Generally speaking, my expert looks quite smugly at me and knows knows what the meme means, and I have no, I have no understanding of, the, of what the meme means. But um, look, if you've got a meme you want to send set, um, send it over, share it with us, comment on the memes that we're showing, please do join the conversation. So, uh, right, meme one. Let's uh, let's see what the producers have done today uh, to make me look silly. <laughs> firewall. Um, it doesn't mean hide inside a server room during a fire. Thomas, what, what is that saying to you? Because it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I highly recommend not staying inside if there is a fire. Um, however, though, I mean, like yeah. what I've seen, there's also physical firewalls, which actually protects the server room from fire. So, yeah, who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's fair enough, and also great advice. Don't get burned by a fire. So um, you know, solid, uh, solid memeing there. Uh, right. Definitely so, learned something new here. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's new, um, but it's obvious. Um, and if you haven't learned it, then uh, then you should have. Um, so uh, right, okay. So let's have a look at the second meme. <laughs> right, and that's uh, that's Doctor Evil, I think. So. Um, I think is he uh, is he is he take, is he taking the Mickey? I think he might be. What's, what what are you seeing in that one, Thomas? I guess it's like a, there are quite some outages caused by power supplies in the world uh, because power supplies yeah. fails, and there is usually a lot of like um, vendors who have different classes of power supplies available, and they pretend like they cannot fail, they're fail safe, and at the end we all learn they still fail, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like everything fails at some point in time. Um, so that like, uh, you know, right? <laughs> um, thanks, Doctor Evil, and thank you. I think Doctor Evil is possibly one of the producers. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Doctor Evil. Uh, right. Okay. So look, let's um, let, let, let's just summarize what we've learned today, um, and let's you know let's talk about um, kind of all those little things that, that we've learned. So, you know, as always, you know, I made a few notes. So, um, number one, containers are the evolution of VMs. They're kind of like, um, if you were to give, um, you know, VMs like steroids and beef them up and get them to do everything you need to do, that's kind of what containers are, right? So they're 40% yep. smaller and typically speaking, 30% faster. So this is what, well, to just to compare from Windows containers with 2022 versus Windows yeah. containers with 2019, right? Uh, we're not speaking wow. like, so in terms of VMs, it's probably like 
even even crazier, right? But um, right. Okay. Uh, the the thing is just between different versions of of the of Windows Server 2019 containers versus Windows Server 2022 containers. Perfect. Go and buy Windows Server 2022, and you can be uh, forty percent smaller and thirty percent faster. Love that. And um, you need to when you're thinking about um, using containers, it's smart to build in layers. So yep. layers will give you that efficiency of containerization so that you get yep. the most out of your um, out of your environments. Yes, exactly. And you need to definitely think of like um, the, the reason why I brought this up here is like when you when we talk about again, when we come when we tell people what containers are, we compare it to VMs, right? In the VM, most of the time what we see is actually okay, you build one image, you build that out, and then maybe you go into the VM and you install software, right? Um, this is not how you do it with the container part. You, you could you could do it that way in some cases, but you don't get then all the benefits of having that. And so by creating it as infrastructure as code, basically by writing a Docker file, um, if you do like uh, do other things, there's even more to do if you do multiple of these applications together. Um, but yeah, then you get the benefits, get most out of it. Absolutely. Cool. So look, Thomas, as always, thank you so, so much for today's episode. Thank you for teaching us things that we didn't know um, and explaining things that we thought we knew, but actually, you know, it's even better with the latest version of Windows Server. So but we always appreciate it. Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. Um, this has been From the Rock to the Cloud. Uh, we will hopefully um, catch you, catch your eye on either uh, you're watching us on Channel 9, you're watching us on LinkedIn, you're watching us on YouTube. And, um, you know, keep your eye out for that next episode. Uh, and drop us your thoughts and comments. Um, and as always, uh, keep it classy, San Diego. Right. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>